Hi, I'm Tim Miner with Modern Stetter, and we're here at the Edible Learning Lab in Buffalo, Wyoming to talk about vermicomposting. Vermiculture is the process of using worms to transform organic material and recapture those nutrients. In, in our study of it, it's really the root of building good soil. We're using raised planters in what used to be the music room here in the basement of the old school. So for us, the idea of being able to maintain good soil without mother nature's involvement being in the outside like a traditional outdoor garden would be, we need to be able to pay attention to soil health and, and build that over time. The worm castings contain uh, a lot of stuff that is beneficial to plants, particularly in the soil. Uh, we can use these castings in one of two ways. We can make a, a tea, uh, an elixir if you will, that will allow us to extract uh, the nutrients. Uh, it'll allow us to pull out uh, the microbial mass that's in there, all of the bacteria, uh, fungi. Um, it allows us to also pull out uh, small particulates of organic matter that are beneficial to the plant at, uh, at small levels. And so when we do this, this compost, what we're actually doing is letting the worms do the work. It's passive for us, active for them. So when we, when we extract these castings from the bin, um, we're taking them out in, in basically a raw form. This is the worm poop, right? This is uh, the castings or the vermicast. In those castings, um, you have mucus on the outside of it that helps to bind it together. When we transfer this into our raised planters, that mucus will help to actually bind with the soil and keep those nutrients in place longer, uh, longer than say a commercial fertilizer applied as a spray or a mist. It also contains nutrients, right? Um, when it comes through the worm, the bacteria does what they do. We're actually transforming those inputs. We're not just recapturing the nutrients, we're, we're increasing the nutritive value of those, those castings. I don't know, I think the, the biggest benefit on the worm castings for us, what, the way we use it in the lab, is the fact that it's just available. We're not going onto Amazon and looking for the right mix. We're, we're using what we're pulling from our hydro towers, what we're pulling from our raised planters. We're throwing it in here, let the worms do it. For us, it's a non-thought, right? We just, we feed them and we walk away. Right. And then we come back later, we build another level, we build another level. Then we harvest what's on that first level. It's now been cured a little bit. Um, the worms follow the food, so they move up the chain. So add, as we add, you know, another level and build bedding, the worms will come up through the bottom, right? So this worm condo, if you will, sort of self-regulates, right? The worms are chasing the food higher. They're leaving the castings below. We go in and harvest those without a whole lot of work. We're not picking worms out to try and, you know, keep them out of the, the system. We throw it into some cheesecloth, throw it in the bucket with water, an aerator, and some molasses, and let it go for, for 24 hours. When we come back, we've got this brown liquid that's you know frothy on the top that we can dilute and use as a soil drench on our raised planters, and we'll see those plants perk up in the first 24 hours. We actually do, um, well, to, to start off, we use a second composting process as well, a hot composting system outside where we can do 250 gallons at once. But even in an accelerated system like we have out there, it's still 90 days to produce an end product where we have an almost continuous supply with vermicomposting. We always have castings that we can pull off. Once we've established this system, as we continue to add levels, we're harvesting the bottom level. And, and what comes out of one of these trays is, is quite a bit. I mean, we can make probably 25 gallons of compost tea just with the, the vermicast that would be in one, one level of the, the worm farm. Well, we, uh, on our raised planters, which are eight feet by three feet, um, we would apply five gallons. Now, when we pull out the castings and we make five gallons of compost tea, we're gonna dilute that on a five to one. So five gallons of tea becomes 25 gallons. So with three raised planters, we only need 15 gallons to start. And if we were to do that once a month, which we do to build the soil, um, and we've seen notif noticeable benefits from doing that, we don't need a lot. You know, this goes a long way. 
Yeah, we use these Worm Factory 360s, uh, about $120 on Amazon. Um, this is a you know plug and play system. Um, the box comes with everything you need to create the initial set of bedding uh, for the worms. Um, we order the worms uh, independently, and they come in bags of a thousand. Um, a thousand worms is enough to start uh, with a single layer for one farm, and um, the idea of, of needing a solution that is somehow completely dialed in um, isn't all that important. You know, what we've discovered over the year of maintaining um, our three worm farms is that you could do this with a storage bin, um, some way to allow, you know, that liquid that, that builds up the leachate uh, to escape so that you don't end up with the bad odors. Um, you need shredded paper. We use coconut core. Um, as a sustainable or, or more sustainable option than peat for building the bedding. Um, and then just a little bit of the, uh, of the mineral rock dust. Um, worms have a, uh, a gizzard, much like birds do. And, you know, they use the contraction of muscles to squeeze food. And having little uh, pieces of rock in there help them with their digestive process. Um, so you could set this entire thing up um, really on a DIY system with, with nothing more than, you know, a, a very cheap order of coconut core, uh, some shredded paper, and, um, you know, and a, and a little bit of rock dust. And you could probably even use, you know, sand or something that you find, uh, you know, around your school. We employ the get your hands dirty approach. Uh, you know, when you're working with K through five specifically, the kids want to have that tactile experience. So, um, there's no method to the madness. Um, we mix it to a, a prearranged recipe. Essentially, we're mixing coconut core and the, um, the shredded paper in equal amounts. Uh, the worms will actually eat that paper over time. It's a source of carbon for them, which is an energy source. Uh, and then the kids get in and, and mix it up with their hands. The dust that we use is pretty fine and you don't want to be breathing that in. So I typically handle that part myself. We sprinkle it over the top and then, and then gently mix it in. And beyond that, it's just water and worms and whatever food you're going to give them. Some people will, will put other things in. They'll put in um, a liquid version of kelp um, as food for the bacteria uh, and the fungi that are, that are going to be extracted in that process. Um, you can add other um, ingredients to it. We don't add anything other than molasses. We actually get ours from uh, Uncle Jim's, my home state of Pennsylvania. Um, very proud to be using Pennsylvania worms. Uh, they come in a bag um, inside a box through regular mail, so you're getting live worms. It takes them uh, about a week to reacclimate. When you get them, they'll be lethargic. Um, you'll put them in uh, under some bedding, make sure that you have the proper moisture levels, and then they'll, they'll spring back. Ours took three or four days, and then they started to become active, and by the end of the first week, they were roaming around and, and munching the way you would expect them to. Um, it doesn't cost very much. Uh, we got uh, three bags of a thousand each. So we have a thousand for each one of our three farms. And I th think we got them for $25. Um, so it's, it's very inexpensive. It'd be a great project to do even for um, an ongoing school project um, in younger grades uh, in a classroom. And the type that we use are red wigglers. Those are sort of the, the gold standard for composting worms. Not all worms are created equal. Um, composting worms, red wigglers in particular, like to stay at a much uh, higher level in the soil structure. They like to be at the top where the loose stuff is. Um, in nature, you might find them below a tree where leaves have been collecting for years and everything is loose and it's easy for them to, to get through. They're not tunnelers by trade. So red wigglers are actually feeding on the organic material that's present in the soil. So we give them stems, leaves that have turned brown, basically any part of the plant that we're not either consuming as a snack here in class or selling off to one of our partner restaurants. Um, for us, what that really means are stems, leaves that have browned on the edges, um, even root balls for that matter. Um, anything that comes out of the kitchen is fine. Um, you have to stay away from uh, any dairy products, uh, any meat, and then anything that would be highly acidic, which typically would be citrus, right? You want to stay away from lemon, lime, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, anything spicy, they have a tendency to ignore. 
and you want to also prepare that food in a way that's more easily digestible for them. Yeah, worms actually breathe through their skin. Uh, they don't have lungs, so they're actually pulling oxygen through their skin, and they can only do that if they remain moist. So uh, a daily ritual for our students is to go through this uh, process of analyzing the worm bins. Um, we put newspaper on top as sort of a wet blanket to, to hold in some moisture. Um, the soil um, that, that we have in here, they'll do a squeeze test to make sure that it clumps together. And if it clumps, then we know we have the appropriate moisture. If it doesn't, uh, we take our little ketchup and mustard squeeze bottles with water and, and we give it a little bit of a, of a douse. It, that changes with the size of the population. Because worms can double their population under ideal conditions every 90 days, we were up to probably four or 5,000 worms um, by the midpoint of the year. I mean, it's, uh, we have the, the two levels. So this active level here is the one that we're feeding in right now. Um, I believe we're on zone six, so we'll have three more feedings in this one before we put another level on, which means that the worms have been active in this lower level um, already. And so the, the castings simply fall down, um, and we've already harvested that out of here a little bit. Um, it's just, it's normal dirt. You know, you can't really tell the difference. It doesn't have a, a smell that would be something different than just rich soil. Modern Stetter has a, uh, a curriculum that covers eight stations, vermiculture being one. Um, we actually have uh, about 350 lessons that can be used in your classroom to teach kids about the deconstructed food production process, and particular with vermiculture, how to build soil, uh, the value of nutrients and the way they flow through the soil, how plants are utilizing them. So if you'd like more information on that, you can visit modernstetter.com and click on the Edible Learning Lab page for more information. Thank you to Bright Agrotech for coming into the Edible Learning Lab, learning a little bit about vermiculture and sharing this with all of you. Please subscribe on the blog. Uh, there are other resources uh, at brightagrotech.com, um, not only about uh, uh, worms, um, but a lot of other things are gonna help you take your classroom garden to the next level.